Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, CNTC seminar today. It's my great pleasure to introduce you, uh, Kun Yang, as our speaker today. Uh, Kun is an expert on theoretical um, strongly correlated system. Uh, he has been working on many uh, directions and uh, made a lot of uh, groundbreaking contribution, including quantum hole effect, superconductivity, quantum phase transition, and uh, uh, bosonization. Um, he got his uh, PhD from Indiana University and did a uh, postdoc in Princeton and Caltech, and now he's a professor at uh, Florida State University. He's going to tell us about interplay of uh, topology and geometry in fresh quantum hole uh, liquid. Uh, please take away, uh, Quinn. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I guess I'm still sharing my screen, right? So you're still seeing my screen. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, so thanks a lot, uh, Yangzhi, for the invitation and introduction. Uh, uh, it's a really great pleasure and honor to speak at the CMTC. Uh, I have visited the CMTC uh, several times, but the last time was actually, I think, some 10 years ago now, uh, when you were still in the uh, physics building. I actually learned relatively recently that you guys moved to your own building, so I haven't had a chance to visit yet. I'd rather be uh, actually up in uh, uh, DC uh, uh, this time, even though it's winter. But anyway, we'll do what we can uh, at this time uh, of the, uh, of the, I guess, uh, history, if you wish. So um, this is a uh, talk on quantum Hall effect. Um, like many quantum Hall talks, uh, I'm going to start with uh, this uh, uh, diagram, which uh, uh, most of you have seen uh, n times, uh, where n is a very large number. Um, this plot is unusual in that it actually contains two Nobel Prizes, one for initial quantum Hall effect uh, represented by this plateau and another, which is a functional quantum Hall effect uh, represented by let's say the one third plateau. And uh, there are of course uh, uh, also a sequence of uh, other functional quantum Hall plateaus, um, which of course led to two separate Nobel Prizes that I don't need to tell you about. Now, if I were giving a colloquium, I would actually be bragging about them, but this is a seminar, it actually uh, becomes a liability. I have to actually now justify giving another quantum Hall talk uh, some uh, 20 years after the second Nobel Prize and uh, uh, more than 40 years uh, after the original discovery. Uh, actually, uh, the situation is worse than these two Nobel Prizes. I can actually count at least two more that are directly related to quantum Hall research. Uh, one is the 2010 uh, Nobel Prize uh, for graphene. And uh, what convinced us, uh, graphene actually holds uh, uh, relativistic but direct electrons is this uh, unusual uh, sequence of integer quantum Hall plateaus that actually uh, quantize the half integer instead of integer value. Um, and the next one, which of course is the most recent uh, Nobel Prize in condensed matter physics, uh, is uh, five years ago, 2016, which actually sort of summarized the contribution of quantum Hall research to condensed matter physics by pointing out that it actually essentially opened the uh, topological era that we are in now in condensed matter physics, uh, starting of course from uh, the work of Solis that uh, demonstrated that the quantization of Hall conductance is because it is a topological quantum number or topological invariant. So uh, I actually copied this uh, uh, plot from the, uh, from the Nobel website. Uh, I don't need to explain uh, what it means. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today in some sense uh, is uh, in an orthogonal direction. Uh, even though um, topology is in the title of my talk, uh, it is actually not the keyword. Uh, so the point I'm going to emphasize is that actually even though topology is responsible for quantization or more generally uh, universal physics, uh, there's also very interesting non-universal physics uh, in fractional quantum Hall liquids. And as pointed out by a, uh, to me, very important paper uh, by Duncan Haldane uh, 10 years ago, uh, some of the non-universal physics is actually associated with geometry and not just the topology. So um, the first uh, specific result I'm going to present is uh, this geometry is not just a, a, a theoretical construct, which uh, more often than not is the case uh, 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 for uh, Duncan's work. Uh, it actually can be uh, directly measured experimentally, actually, 
uh, uh, the theory aspect it has matured to some extent that allows for direct and quantitative uh, comparison between theory and uh, experiment. Now, this geometrical degree of freedom does not only exist, it actually also has its own dynamics. And uh, uh, it was pointed out uh, early on by uh, Haldane and the Song and their collaborators that the quantum fluctuation of uh, this geometry gives rise to a spin two excitation, which is uh, in many ways like a graviton. And the second uh, result I'm going to present is that actually this, these gravitons are also real and they can be excited and probed using uh, acoustic waves. And in this context, acoustic waves behave very much like gravitational waves. Um, the last set of results uh, actually uh, is probably the most uh, uh, interesting, uh, points out that uh, these gravitons actually uh, have definitive chirality. And their chirality is actually uh, tied to the topological aspect of the physics. So we're going to come back to topology at the end of the day. And also uh, very importantly, the, the chirality can be uh, directly probed using polarized uh, Raman scattering. And in particular, we're going to uh, propose using this as a method to hopefully pin down the nature of the uh, uh, by have quantum Hall state, which is probably the only candidate of a uh, non abelian uh, quantum Hall uh, state. Anyway, so this uh, uh, also serves as a uh, outline uh, uh, in addition to justification uh, for this talk. But uh, just uh, in case there are uh, beginning uh, graduate students in the audience, I'm going to come back uh, to this plot and uh, very briefly uh, 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 discuss or review the physics uh, behind uh, the quantization of both integer and uh, uh, fractional quantum quantum states. By the way, uh, feel free to uh, interrupt uh, if there are any questions. And I know Shankar is going to interrupt, interrupt even, if, uh, <laughs> even if I don't say that. OK, anyway. So comparatively speaking, the uh, integer quantum power physics is actually very simple. So uh, I guess in retrospect, you probably don't even need the full-fledged quantum mechanics to understand it, all what you need is actually some uh, semi-classical uh, quantization rules. So we know when you put charged particles in the magnetic field, um, they do very boring things. They just circle around. And uh, quantum mechanics or semi-classical quantization rules just tells you that the uh, circle uh, of the cyclotron motion has to come in quantized sizes. Uh, for example, for the lowest lambda level uh, uh, electrons, uh, you have to enclose exactly one plus quantum. So that actually limits uh, how many uh, electrons uh, you can actually uh, put in the lowest lambda level or actually any lambda level. Now, these electrons are actually just running around and not going anywhere. So what is responsible for the uh, non-trivial and actually quantized uh, transport? Well, it turns out uh, these electrons are actually those that live near the edge. So they also try to do the same thing, which is to actually go around a circle. But before they can actually complete a circle, they bounce into the boundary, which we are modeling here as a hard wall. So they bounce into the, uh, the, the wall and then bounce back, but then try to do the same thing. And during the process, you actually, for the uh, right edge, go from uh, uh, the upper end of the sample to the lower end. And similarly, uh, for the electrons on the left edge, uh, they actually end up moving in the, um, in the opposite direction. So the key point here is that these edge electrons have actually uh, a chiral motion. So the direction of the uh, motion is actually fixed. And therefore, there's no backscattering. Uh, that is actually what is responsible for the observed dissipationless transport because Noticing the uh, longitudinal uh, resistance is actually essentially zero. Uh, but that's because of the lack of uh, backscattering and therefore there's no dissipation. And the quantization of the whole conductance is related to the fact that the uh, number of these uh, uh, electrons that you can accommodate in a given, lam uh, given um, lambda level is actually fixed by this quantization rule. So um, one way to actually uh, characterize the integer quantum effect is to use the so-called dancing pattern, which I think is a term 
uh, invented by Xiaogang Wen. So the dancing pattern for the individual quantum ball uh, liquid is actually very simple. So each electron, which is a, uh, uh, which is a, uh, uh, illustrated as a female dancer here, just dance, uh, dances around her uh, uh, own orbit. Uh, so quantum mechanics actually comes in two different ways. One is quantizing the size of this orbital or this dancing circle. So let me see, did I lose my mouse? Okay, it's back. And the other uh, equally important aspect is that uh, the electron of fermions. So everybody Akun, can, can only- Hey Kun. Yes, hi. Can or may I ask you a question? Absolutely. Yeah, so this is a trivial question, but this is something I used to worry a lot about, mm -hmm. but now I don't worry about it anymore. As you, mm -hmm. the actual current flow in quantum Hall sample, mm -hmm. simple picture at all. Dan Sui spent years measuring yes. Klaus von Klitzing did, and that yes. is extremely complicated. You know, nothing yes. is sitting in the bulk, nothing is going along the edge like that. So yes. the picture, at least in this naive form that we theorists think about, from, right. does not apply at all. But should we worry about that? Or to what extent should we worry about that? Okay, so very good question, Shankar. So yes, so you are absolutely right. So this is definitely oversimplification. So the, the, the reason for that is, of course, we have all solved this uh, simple quantum mechanics problem, which is, well, even though if you have a, a, a lambda level wave functions that doesn't carry current, which I'm trying to model using these circles, once you apply a, uh, let's say, weak electric field, the field tilts these, uh, these, uh, 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 these uh, wave functions, and actually these guys start to actually go through the e plus p drift. Now, the ideal situation that I'm trying to illustrate is assuming that the electric field is completely screened in the bulk. If that were the case, and I think that would be the case if the cooling interaction is not one of R, but actually logarithmic, that would indeed lead to complete screening in the, in the 2D situation, then the picture could be taken literally. But in practice, as you pointed out, that's actually not true. So, what so can, 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 can we then agree that it's an idealized picture that we yes. believe in, but yes. right now experimental evidence for it is a bit lacking, right? Uh, actually, experimentally, there is some information. So typically, uh, one number came to my mind is that maybe for a typical size of the bulk, maybe the bulk carries something like 10% of the current, current and the edge maybe is 90%. Of course, if you make the bulk very wide, that ratio will change. But I guess so who's, ex whose experiment is that you are thinking about? Okay, I I I I, I cannot remember. So this right, is, this we'll is, this is something offline. that I came to my mind in my okay, graduate right. years. Go, go on. This is point, not very important. This is not. No, no, no. But but, but yeah, thought. but for the graduate students, which I'm doing this for, this is important. But the key point is that this consideration, which Shankar brought up, which is extremely important and highly relevant, does not affect the quantization. And uh, if you want a more detailed argument, there is actually a discussion uh, of this point uh, in, in my book with Steve Green. Yeah, actually. that's yes. the important point that you do not yes. use the idealized picture for quantization. But exactly, exactly. On the other hand, I mean, the idealization does make the picture simpler and uh, is useful at least uh, when, when you want to actually focus on the more relevant uh, aspect of the physics. Uh, is that uh, satisfactory to you, Shankar? Okay, I take that as yes. To make sure there has been no new development experimentally establishing it, but you know, it's a- Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware detail. of this. I think there were, uh, as you pointed out, uh, people like there and others uh, uh, yeah. did Cla look Klaus, into that. Klaus, yeah. Klaus von Klitzing worries a lot about this point, you know? I see, aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, he. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't get to talk to Klaus much, so yeah. so I wasn't. Uh, he always uh, emphasizes uh, this because he spent quite a bit of time trying to measure it. Dan was the first one, but please go. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So so the, the the dancing pattern here is is trivial. So all what you need to uh, make sure is to follow these quantized steps and uh, make sure that you don't uh, step into other dancers' territory due to the party exclusion principle. On the other hand, comparatively speaking at least, the one third state is much more interesting. So the, the, the nuclear one state, which I hope I made it clear, the basic ingredients or the basic freedom are still these electrons. And they do non-trivial things, for example, they could still flow in the, in the bulk, but you can actually use a one body picture to understand it. On the other hand, uh, the reason the second Nobel Prize was given is because 
uh, the uh, elementary excitations of the one third plateau or the one third liquid are actually no longer electrons, but fractionally charged quasi particles that actually obey fractional statistics, which by the way, uh, has only been uh, demonstrated convincingly uh, only last year. So um, lab physics, uh, including the quantization can also be uh, understood in terms of dancing pattern. So the laughing dancing pattern is, is more slightly more complicated, but definitely much more interesting. So the point is that uh, now you have actually a more lambda orbitals than electrons. So the ratio is three to one. So therefore there's a lot of, a lot more rooms for these dancers. So now the priority in addition to not violating the Pauli principle is you want to actually lower the coolant interaction energy. So the laughing dancing rule, so somehow I'm having difficulty with my mouse. Yeah, okay, that's nice that. So the laughing dancing rule dictates that if one dancer is approaching another dancer who is already occupying a particular spot, you need to go the wrong curve. And uh, the uh, quantization rule or the topological constraint is that because of the quantization of the step size, then the uh, other dancer has to dance around the existing dancer in units of three steps or more quantitatively, uh, the circle that you dance around the uh, existing dancer should contain a uh, three first point. So just uh, using this rule, you can actually understand why you can have a one third charged uh, uh, excitations. So the point is that let's assume uh, your dancing floor has actually a pillar here. And obviously you don't want to dance into the pillar. You don't want to actually bounce into it. So as each electron, each dancer approaches this pillar, you have to dance around that pillar as well. Now, because of this quantization rule, this circle has to enclose uh, one flux quantum, which means charge is actually depleted from this pillar region. So the pillars in, sort of, in some sense introduces a, uh, uh, introduces a, uh, 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 effect in the dancing pattern. So there's some charge depletion. So let's actually, uh, let's actually ask how much charge is depleted. Well, let's compare that with a single electron. So for each electron, the uh, uh, charge, uh, the circle uh, around it encloses three flux quantum. But for the pillar, you enclose just one flux quantum. So therefore, compare the charge of the two, uh, the pillar or the defect, which is the laughing quality hole, uh, should contain uh, one third of the charge. So that's a, a, a sort of hand waving way to explain or understand why you can have one third charged quality particles. Okay, so uh, just to summarize a little bit, uh, we have a trivial, relatively trivial integer dancing pattern. We have a more interesting uh, laughing dancing pattern. Uh, we can actually uh, introduce even more sophisticated dancing patterns. The next one uh, in my list uh, uh, is the Maurice dancing pattern. The Maurice dancing pattern is more interesting in that it allows two dancers to actually be as close as the Pauli principle would allow you. Actually, you can even uh, introduce Maurice dancing pattern for bosons, in which case you can actually have the two dancers right on top of each other. But the rule is that once the two dancers are nearby and doing their intimate things, the third dancer should actually stay in the, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, more read case, uh, four steps away. So this uh, uh, even more uh, uh, complicated dancing pattern gives rise to more complicated question uh, uh, quantum pulse states, uh, namely the more read state. And that uh, actually, uh, we're going to come back to this. It supports uh, not only fractionally charged uh, quasi particles, these quasi particles actually um, obey non abelian fractional statistics, which is good for all kinds of things, including uh, 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 topological quantum computation. Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to do here is to um, use these so called dancing patterns to illustrate the basic uh, topological physics behind uh, various kinds of uh, uh, fractional quantum pulse states. So where is the geometrical aspect? Well, let's actually come back to the laughing dancing pattern. So the laughing dancing pattern dictates that if you have a dancer here, a second dancer can only go around the existing dancer in a loop 
that encloses three fast quantum. That's actually the closest you can get to it. On the other hand, it does not necessarily insist that the circle has to be actually rotationally invariant or circular. You can actually distort the circle to an ellipse as long as you do not change its area. So that is actually a allowed dancing pattern. So it does not actually violate the topological constraint, but it does change the geometrical shape of the correlation. So this was actually pointed out uh, by Helden, not necessarily in these words. And uh, his point is that uh, the version from the whole dancing pattern has both uh, topological and geometrical uh, aspects. Uh, the latter is actually uh, uh, determined uh, by energetics. For example, you may be wondering why you want to distort this uh, uh, circle to an uh, ellipse. Well, I can imagine, for example, you have a, a anisotropic uh, cooling interaction, which let's say is uh, stronger in the horizontal direction than the vertical direction. So you, in that case, you would prefer to stay away from each other even further uh, along the x direction than the y direction, and this distortion would accommodate that. And hey, um, Kuhn, yes. Kuhn, I'm sorry, yes. Kuhn, hold on. I don't yes. understand that. In yes. a system with an isotropic effective mass. Yes, no. that's what I'm getting to, oh. yes. Coulomb interaction is not anisotropic. Yes, what, so, what so, isotropic? so the Coulomb interaction, for example, would be anisotropic if you had a uh, crystal that has a uh, uh, anisotropic dielectric function. Correct. The dielectric function in general would be, uh, would be a ten, rank two tensor. Right, but, but your slide system, says effective mass on isotropy. That's what I'm pointing Exactly, so that's what I'm getting to. So okay, all right. When you have uh, mass and isotropy, well, the cooling interaction is still isotropic, but the natural way to actually going around the circle is actually the ellipse instead of the uh, uh, circle itself. So now you need to actually accommodate uh, to find a good compromise uh, between the two. And actually much of the technical part of my talk is actually about that. So, but, but, but conceptually, the point is that uh, you have this freedom that allows you to distort the dancing a uh, dancing circle um, with the topological constraint that the area of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, ellipse actually cannot change. So, so, so Helden came up with this name of uh, area preserving uh, diffeomorphism. So one immediate consequence of this uh, uh, geometrical degree of freedom, this anisotropy basically, is that contrary to what uh, you have been told, that uh, Laughlin is such a unique variational uh, wave function that doesn't even have a variational degree of freedom. It actually has a hidden uh, variational parameter, which is pre uh, precisely this geometry. So, so we have actually constructed uh, this uh, family, one parameter family of uh, Laughlin states. Um, the original Laughlin wave function corresponds to the isotropic case, which has a completely circular correlation hole. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, vary this parameter, I mean, the detail of the parameterization is not particularly important here. Let's say I take a value one half. Well, this uh, correlation hole is distorted even though it actually has the same uh, area. But this geometry is actually not probed by the transport measurement. Uh, as long as transport is concerned, you still have this plateau and a uh, vanishing uh, longitudinal uh, resistance uh, because it is actually a topological invariant. So it does not, is not sensitive to any non-universal, including geometrical aspects. Uh, therefore, it's actually quantized and therefore in some sense it's boring. So it looks like uh, the quantum Hall effect somehow uh, uh, avoids or hides this uh, uh, geometrical aspect, which uh, conceptually has been, uh, has been pointed out. Uh, well, the situation is actually not too bad because as we uh, discussed, one third is not the, not the only state. You also have the sequence, one third, two fifths, uh, uh, seven thirds, et cetera, which eventually ends at one half. Uh, you could actually also um, reverse the logic and say the one half state uh, is actually, even though it's not a quantum Hall state, is actually the parent state uh, of all the neighboring uh, Fractional quantum Hall states, including actually one third and two third. Um, I don't necessarily uh, endorse that viewpoint, but in either case, uh, either uh, 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 approach of the logic, uh, you would conclude that if all the fractional quantum Hall states 
uh, have this geometrical uh, degree of freedom, it should also be present uh, at one half. And at one half, of course, you don't have this uh, uh, quantization, and therefore you may be able to do a little bit more. So uh, I probably don't need to tell you the one half state is extremely uh, interesting in, in its uh, own right. And uh, uh, turns out this is actually a good playground to actually explore this geometry as well. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 this has uh, been started. This was started uh, in Sheridan's group uh, actually uh, before they realized that they were actually uh, exploring the geometry. Um, so let me actually just very briefly review the physics. So let's start with a zero magnetic field. Uh, well, a zero magnetic field the electron is just a form a Fermi C. Uh, if you have a complete isotropy, the Fermi surface will be uh, circular. Now, then you turn on magnetic field and uh, put the system at a half filling, which means you have uh, two flux quanta for each electron. That's the uh, the right uh, uh, upper right uh, panel. Uh, then, uh, well, its theoretical construct is you actually somehow suck the flux. Uh, onto the electron to turn them into what's known as composite fermions. They are still fermions because the flux quantum, the flux ca uh, carried by each of them is still, uh, it's an even integer of, uh, of flux quantum, so it doesn't change the statistics. But now these composite fermions see zero net magnetic field. And therefore, they actually also form a Fermi C. And that Fermi C, but just by symmetry, would also be circular. So what Shagan uh, and his group was asking is a very interesting question. What if you have mass and isotropy, as Shankar was actually pointing out? Um, then you would, of course, get a anisotropic Fermi surface at zero magnetic field directly reflecting the anisotropy of the effective mass. And the question they asked is, well, what happens to the composite fermion uh, Fermi surface, which should also be uh, anisotropy, but then the question is, what's the relation between these two anisotropies? So experimentally, there are actually uh, two different ways to actually control uh, the mass anisotropy. Uh, in the original experiment, uh, in published in 13, 2013, they use the in-plane magnetic field. So usually we use in-plane magnetic field to, uh, to actually uh, couple to the, uh, to, the, to the spin of the electron. But because the quantum well that confines the electron also has some uh, finite width. It also has some orbital coupling. So, so that actually gives rise to a uh, uh, anisotropic uh, um, mass tensor, which uh, uh, just to sort of uh, in preparation for what I'm going to do later, I'm going to write that as a metric tensor, it's a rank two tensor. Uh, another way uh, to control the uh, uh, electron dispersion is to actually use string. The string, of course, uh, dis uh, uh, distorts the lattice structure and that obviously will also um, uh, affect the electron dispersion. So uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the experimental details. Uh, Mansour actually also many other people earlier uh, developed a sophisticated ways to actually probe uh, the Fermi surface shape. I guess I think starting from uh, uh, actually Bob Willett in the uh, early 90s uh, the, using these so-called uh, geometrical resonances. Uh, if you're interested in, I, I can discuss that uh, uh, maybe later on. So, so the, uh, the surprise is that, well, the unsurprising result is that, well, once you have this uh, mass anisotropy, uh, not only the electron Fermi surface is distorted, so is the composite fermion uh, Fermi surface. But the surprise is that they always find the composite fermion Fermi surface is much less anisotropic than the electron uh, Fermi surface. And this is contrary to the very naive Chern Simons mean field theory, which actually just uh, have the same uh, 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 effective mass for electron and composite fermion, in which case uh, they would actually have the same anisotropy as well. And uh, in fact, there were indeed uh, published uh, 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 predictions that uh, these two should have uh, the same uh, Fermi surface shape, or at least the same anisotropy. So um, the first result I'm going to uh, uh, show actually uh, on the next slide is that actually, first of all, uh, qualitatively or conceptually, uh, the composite fermion from the surface is a direct reflection of Haldane's geometry. And uh, this is actually satisfying in the following sense. We know that for Fermi surfaces, we have the so-called Luttinger theorem. The Luttinger theorem tells you that the Fermi surface shape can change, let's say due to 
uh, electron electron interaction, but its area cannot. So in momentum space, uh, the Fermi surface actually uh, 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 exhibits so called area preserving diffeomorphism. And this, I claim, is exactly the same area preserving diffeomorphism Helden was talking about, but in real space. So then the uh, question is well, uh, how are the real, spa uh, uh, real space and uh, uh, momentum space uh, related to each other? Well, this of course is due to magnetic field. So again, for uh, any student who has taken a quantum mechanics uh, course, you have solved the Landau problem and the Landau uh, gauge uh, tell, uh, gives rise to a, a, a conserved momentum, let's say KY actually tells you uh, where the wave function is uh, along the X direction. So, in a way, the uh, momentum space and real space are actually related to each other just by a uh, 90 degree uh, rotation. Okay, so this is the claim. Uh, so, uh, so let me actually demonstrate that uh, via a uh, exactly solvable model. And this is the only technical slide actually uh, of, the, of the entire talk. So let me actually go through it uh, slowly so that uh, any beginning graduate student can actually follow. So the Simplicity, if you wish, of quantum Hall physics is that in the limit of strong magnetic field, uh, everything happens in a given lambda level, let's say the lowest lambda level. So the kinetic energy is completely quenched. So you don't have to worry about the kinetic energy anymore. And uh, uh, the uh, two body interaction, usually cooling interaction for uh, electrons, uh, actually uh, dominance is shown. So let's actually write it down and uh, we work usually in the momentum space. Now, if in your quantum mechanics exam, uh, the professor gives you a problem in which the Hamiltonian only has the potential energy, but now, uh, but no kinetic energy at all, you will say, okay, oh, hey, wow, this must be Christmas time because that'll be the easiest problem because the difficulty with solving quantum mechanics problem is because the kinetic energy and potential energy don't commute with each other. Well, now we have a situation where we don't have the kinetic energy, but there is, of course, no free launch because I did give you the constraint that you have to project the whole problem into the lowest lambda level. And when you do that, you find that the potential energy term becomes highly non-trivial. Um, the way to do that is actually to um, replace the electron coordinate by the so-called guiding center coordinate. And that is actually independent of which lambda level you are in. And the lambda level information is actually encoded in this uh, so-called uh, lambda level form factor. And that depends on which lambda level you are in. And uh, it's simplest as you would expect for the lowest lambda level where n equals zero, in which case it's only a Gaussian. So this is just reflecting the fact that the lambda level wave functions are Gaussian wave functions and the uh, uh, Sorry, uh, uh, harmonic oscillator wave functions and the uh, ground state of harmonic oscillator is a, has a Gaussian wave function. Now, the anisotropy of the kinetic energy is actually encoded, is encoded in this uh, uh, lambda level uh, form factor. And the uh, lowest lambda level form factor now has this uh, uh, anisotropic uh, Gaussian uh, uh, function. Okay, so this is where the anisotropy. Uh, which I use the parameter A to actually parameterize uh, and everything else uh, uh, is actually just the interaction. Okay, so, so the interaction controls this part, but the effective mass tensor controls the lambda level form factor. Okay, so the exactly solvable model that I chose also has this Gaussian interaction. So the nice thing about the Gaussian is it's fully transformed, it's also Gaussian. So let's say we have a isotropic Gaussian interaction, which also has an isotropic uh, Fourier transform. When I, I combine this isotropic Gaussian with this anisotropic Gaussian, I get yet another anisotropic Gaussian whose anisotropy can be read out very easily. And because it's a mixture between something that's isotropic and anisotropic, the resultant anisotropy will always be less then the original anisotropy that comes from the effective mass anisotropy. So this immediately tells you uh, qualitatively that uh, the, uh, uh, the lambda, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
composite fermion fermi surface uh, should have less anisotropy than the uh, uh, bare electron uh, fermi surface anisotropy. Um, and uh, this uh, uh, exact relation has actually been uh, confirmed numerically. But at this point, I haven't even told you what the feeling factor is, because I'm only telling you about the homotonian. So when I apply uh, this, uh, yes. Uh, may I ask you a question here? Yes, of course. Yeah. So this is, of course, very elegant, but this is a general property of uh, an isotropic system, meaning yes. gas. If yes. you take an electron gas and calculate yes. energy, yes. Uh, high, high density limit, as you know, you can calculate that exactly, right? In the yes. And you can calculate the effective mass normalization. And yes. always the interacting system, it's, I don't want to call it a theorem, but it's always the interacting system has less anisotropy than the inter, uh, non-interacting system. Uh, now, here, is it something like that or is it something more subtle? I mean, I know you're calling it a geometric effect, but I'm trying yeah. to understand it algebraically. Right, so, so Shankar, you, you make a very good point. So it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but it's actually related. So, so, so there are two aspects of it. One is that the electron-electron interaction is present both at zero magnetic field and in the high magnetic field. So, so, so it enters in both ways. Uh, experimentally, what is found is that the uh, uh, anisotropy uh, is less when you turn on a high magnetic field. So you are not changing it. It's not like that you turn off the interaction in one case and turn on the interaction in the other case. But of course, I mean, these two things are not, not, uh, uh, not, um, not uh, uh, entirely orthogonal. But, but there is also a quantitative aspect of it. So, so in the next slide, uh, I'm going to actually make quantitative comparison, semi-quantitative comparison with actually with Mansour's experiment. But qualitatively, I, I agree with you that um, the, uh, 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 if you have a, uh, um, if you have a isotropic interaction and mix that with anisotropic, um, with anisotropic uh, effective mass, you will end up with something that's not quite as anisotropic. What I'm just saying is that the difference between zero and energy field is not just the interaction, but it's actually mainly because you are actually projecting everything to the lowest lambda level. The, the interaction is actually the same. Does that uh, more or less uh, address your question? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get it. Yeah, go on. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so this is qualitative and actually I haven't even uh, uh, specified the, uh, uh, I haven't even specified the filling factor yet. So if I apply this to half filling, I came up with this, uh, this uh, uh, qualitative prediction that you should always have less anisotropy. But if I actually apply to one third, then everything I have done here is exactly the same. The one third state should have exactly the same anisotropy as one half state. So therefore, that, at least within this model, the anisotropy for the one third state that Haldane talked about and the anisotropy of the Fermi, composite Fermi and Fermi surface that Shagan measured in his lab are exactly the same thing. So that's the qualitative message that uh, I was trying to uh, convey here. But now let's actually try to be a little bit more quantitative. So I think partially motivated by, by the theoretical progress uh, uh, in the later experiment, as the same group, uh, they actually uh, uh, studied more quantitatively the relation between the composite fermion anisotropy and the uh, electron anisotropy, which they can control more, uh, 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 more easily by applying a string. And they found that uh, empirically, there is actually a very simple relation between them, which is composite fermion and isotropy is almost always, uh, almost exactly actually also uh, equal to the square root of the uh, original electron, which they call fermion and isotropy. So, uh, well, they try to actually understand the, uh, 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 their finding uh, uh, using this uh, uh, earlier result that I just presented. So maybe just to force it a little bit, uh, they can factor out the square root of uh, uh, this anisotropy alpha, which I, I think I called A. But then they find that if they actually choose the range of interaction, range of my Gaussian interaction, uh, which is the only parameter uh, uh, here, to be equal 
to the magnetic lens, then this extra factor completely cancel. And you find exact agreement uh, between the, the formulas that I present uh, in the previous slide and the experiment. So, um, well, this is a, a little bit uh, 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 too good to be true in some sense. However, it's actually not entirely surprising. So uh, the reason is actually the following. Now, uh, the actual interaction that they have is, of course, not the Gaussian interaction, but a cooling interaction. But one thing that's actually unusual about the cooling interaction is that it doesn't have a scale. But I need a, a parameter here, this s, which is the range of the interaction. So what I already actually observed in this paper is that, well, in reality, um, the cooling interaction is actually softened when the uh, in-plane separation between the electrons becomes of order the well width. And the well width, therefore, actually uh, introduces a scale for the uh, cooling interaction. And the uh, typical size of the well width is something like 100 angstrom, which is true for uh, Shagan samples. But also, the typical size of the uh, magnetic lens is also the, uh, of order 100 angstrom. So therefore, uh, the two indeed are very comparable. And therefore, in that uh, regard, this uh, agreement is actually not too surprising. And in later uh, detailed numerical work, uh, 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 my uh, uh, friend Robin Barth and his associates found that even if you don't actually introduce uh, the uh, uh, well with effect, but just to use the bare one watt per interaction, uh, you also get a very uh, uh, good one uh, square root relation. And that, again, maybe in retrospect, is not too surprising either because uh, the lambda level form factor spreads out the uh, cooling interaction as well. Anyway, so I think uh, the, uh, I don't want to uh, emphasize the quantitative agreement too much, but I think it's fair to say that uh, at least in the static limit, uh, we have a good both qualitative and uh, semi-quantitative uh, understanding of the, uh, uh, at least the existence of this geometrical uh, uh, aspect of fractional quantum hall physics, which is directly revealed by the shape of the composite fermion, uh, fermion surface. Okay, so uh, I think I'm doing okay with time. So maybe I just pause for a few seconds to see if there are questions at this point, as I'm going to switch gear a little bit. So Kuhn, I just wanted to point out that even the square root dependence, yes, very roughly what you find for a um, regular electron gas, because there you find that if you have an, an, an isotropic system, uh, wow. no matter how strong the anisotropy is, you can kind of approximately, uh, you can approximate the effective mass as, with the density of state's mass in the interaction. Okay you know, which as you know, goes as square root, but now it's not exact there, okay. uh, but, but it's, so there is something here, which is a property of, I think, Coulomb interaction, which is what you're emphasizing anyway. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, you're right. So, so for example, uh, in this work, if you change it to, let's say one of R squared or one of R fourth, you don't get the square root anymore. Right, you change the, exactly. You change the, yeah. okay, I see. So, so, so Shankar, you have some insights. On why yeah. that's the case. Well, that's because we have been recently doing a lot of work on uh, anisotropic. We are basically redoing Abrikos of Gorkov Zylashansky for uh, um, anisotropic system. It turns out nobody has ever done it because it's technically quite challenging. So this why is the, are you do, why, this, why are you doing that? I'm just curious. Oh, because this is something that interests me. You know, nobody can do these things anymore. Everybody who could do these things are dead. So. <laughs> So, so it should be done. Well, we, we, because we, we, we did we did lose lab uh, two years ago. Yes. Yeah. We we need to do this because uh, most semiconductor systems are anisotropic, right? Yes, of course. That's actually part of the reason I'm doing what I'm doing here as well. Yeah. So. Because think about it. People have been using this, uh, uh, you know, this density of uh, 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 this effective density of states approximation for fifty years now, right? And yes, of course. It has never been justified, so that's that's the goal here. Yeah. I see. I see. Well, it's very interesting to, to uh, actually compare this with with, with, the, with the high field limit and see if, if there's any cross uh, cross inside we can take advantage of. Right. Right. We should do that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Janka.
Okay, so, so I hope I've convinced you that this uh, uh, geometrical degree of freedom uh, does exist and we actually can probe it directly. And uh, they, it doesn't only exist, it actually has its own uh, uh, quantum dynamics. So, so it was actually uh, pointed out, uh, uh, actually uh, by Haldane and some, but actually there are quite a bit of precursor even that goes back to, 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 to Li and Zhang in 1990. That is actually the quantum dynamics of this uh, uh, geometrical degree of freedom should give rise to a quadric polar mode, which in other words, it should actually have spin two. And I think Haldane uh, called it graviton and the song called it uh, graviton as well for one paper, but, but, uh, but, but, but now he changed it back to, uh, to GMP mode. Anyway, so, so I'm still going to call it graviton for the, for the rest of uh, today's talk. So, so therefore, uh, we have the following picture, which I think is now uh, more or less complete of the collective uh, excitation spectrum of a function of quantum point liquid like let's say one third. So it was understood early on that we have this uh, magneto rotor mode, uh, which has a minimum uh, actually uh, uh, near, I guess, uh, uh, mom momentum of order one over the magnetic lens. And uh, this is a bipolar active mode. So you can actually excite it using light or a dipolar uh, 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 matrix element. Um, the new insight is that, well, if you take the zero wave vector limit, what you end up having is a uh, spin two uh, excitation, which is actually a quadrupolar mode and therefore it's not dipole active. So the unfortunate thing therefore is you cannot use light absorption to directly excite or probe it. Unlike, for example, the cyclotron mode, you can use uh, uh, light to excite it, and the Cohen theorem actually tells you that it should exhaust all the spectral weight. So the question is, well, how are you going to excite uh, the graviton mode? Well, because of the graviton, the obvious uh, 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 alternative is instead of using electromagnetic wave, we should be using gravitational wave. So now we all, all know that we have gravitational wave propagating uh, all over our rooms. Uh, but that was actually not the case uh, when I actually uh, put out this proposal. Uh, just notice the date was August 2015, which was a, a month and a half before uh, uh, LIGO uh, received the first uh, uh, gravitational wave uh, signal. So that actually got me into a little bit of trouble with referees because they don't believe uh, such a thing called gravitational wave. Now, of course, I was not really talking about the real gravitational wave, but actually analog it, which is a, a actually acoustic wave. So the idea is that acoustic wave actually induces local strain, which modifies the local effective mass metric. And as we already demonstrated, that actually is what actually couples to the geometrical degree of freedom. So in that sense, it is like a oscillating uh, a metric which of course is what gravitational wave uh, does for you. So uh, we can actually do the following. So yeah, my mouse is again, not working very well. So my favorite setup is we have this two dimensional electron gas here, which of course is sandwiched by two crystals and I can propagate the, uh, the acoustic wave in the perpendicular direction. So we can control the frequency by controlling the frequency of the uh, uh, acoustic wave, but the wave vector seen by the electron is actually zero because the wave is perpendicular to the to the to the to the electron gas plane. Now, if you want a finite wave vector gravitational wave, then you can control the angle of the uh, uh, acoustic wave. So you can therefore control the frequency and wave vector of what I call in quotation marks the gravitational wave independently. And the limiting case, of course, is the surface acoustic wave, which propagates. Um, parallel to the 2D point, but I'm going to mainly focus on the zero wave vector limit. So I'm not going to go through the algebra, which turned out to be similar to the previous slide I showed in some detail, but the, uh, the key point is that the coupling between the oscillating metric and the electron gas is a D wave coupling. It's actually D X squared minus Y squared uh, uh, form. And um, if we have a graviton uh, collective mode, uh, it should be detectable via the uh, absorption rate of the acoustic wave, and it should show up as a uh, resonance, very much like a cyclotron resonance if you shine uh, electromagnetic waves through the two deck. 
So the prediction is that uh, if you have this graviton, it should show up as a very sharp uh, resonance peak in the spectral function that I showed you uh, in the slide. And indeed, uh, while I was actually um, fighting my losing battle with the PIO referees, I uh, 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 recruited Ed Rezai, my long-term collaborator, who calculated this, uh, uh, calculated this uh, uh, spectral function. And indeed, he found very sharp and uh, very pronounced graviton peaks in the spectral function for the bosonic laughing state at half filling and the fermionic uh, one third laughing state. In one case, the spectral weight is 97%. In the other case, it's actually 70%. It's almost as good as GMP, actually. I think in this case, it's even better than GMP. Um, however, uh, there is another aspect that was not revealed in this calculation, which is what is the chirality of the uh, uh, graviton. So I said the graviton should have uh, angular momentum two, but in two dimensions, it should have two possible chiralities. It's either plus two or minus two. And in this work, we demonstrated that it is actually minus two by actually altering the dx squared minus y squared uh, spectral uh, uh, weight to a uh, alt uh, uh, altered uh, operator, which actually carries angular momentum minus two and plus two uh, respectively. So we found that, well, uh, for the Laughlin state, which is the exact state when you use the uh, one pseudo potential, the plus two spectral weight is identically zero, while the, uh, um, while the uh, uh, minus two spectral weight uh, is actually very sharply peaked at uh, a particular energy. And uh, um, therefore the conclusion is that for Laughlin state, which is actually a, the most prominent example of a, a particle-like state, the graviton should have polarization minus two. On the other hand, if you actually uh, perform a particle transformation, let's say to go to two third, then you reverse the chirality. So the holes see a opposite, uh, holes actually uh, do a, a cyclotron dancing in the opposite uh, direction. So for them, you should actually have a plus two uh, chirality. So this is a full model calculation. For the uh, more realistic uh, cooler interaction, we find something very, very similar. Again, the minus two spectral weight dominates but the plus two spectral weight is, uh, is, is not exactly zero, but barely visible, which, which are these uh, little dots. So you find that uh, if you actually uh, have a way to actually uh, couple selectively to either, either the plus two or minus two gravitons, if they exist, you should only see the minus two uh, uh, gravitons. So turns out uh, it's very difficult to actually come up with these uh, 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 polarized gravitational waves but we have a, uh, uh, actually an electromagnetic alternative, which is to use a Raman scattering. So the point is that uh, photons carry angular momentum one. So a single photon process uh, cannot excite the graviton. But a two photon process, which uh, a Raman scattering is, it uh, uh, absorbs the photon and emits a photon. You can actually uh, induce a change of uh, either plus two or minus two for the electron system. And therefore, if you were to use um, spin polarized uh, light to perform a uh, Raman scattering, you should actually not only detect the existence of graviton, but also uh, probe its chirality. So this was actually done, but not as a spin pol as a uh, polarized version was uh, by uh, Aaron Pinsack when he was still at Bell Labs back in 93, uh, all the way to, to the early 90s. And uh, they indeed found uh, actually fairly sharp excitations. And we actually compared uh, our calculations with his results and found a reasonably good semi-quantitative agreement. But of course, uh, we are still uh, not quite doing the same thing because one is Raman, the other is actually gravitational uh, coupling. But in this very recent uh, preprint by Nagu and Song, they demonstrated that actually our gravitational spectral weight is actually identical to the polarized Raman spectral weight. So we are actually uh, comparing apple with apple and orange with orange. Okay, so, so we uh, actually uh, have uh, talked to Aaron and strongly encouraged him to actually redo uh, his Raman experiments, uh, but now using a polarized uh, light to actually directly 
uh, reveal the uh, uh, this uh, uh, minus two graviton for for laughing state at one third, but going to two third, you uh, they should see the opposite priority. Um, but that's actually, of course, not the most exciting state uh, anymore. The one third state. Uh, the most exciting state is actually five half. And uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about that, but even uh, already uh, in this uh, uh, paper that we published in 2019, we actually looked at a, a sort of watered down version of the more state, not at one half, but actually for bosons at nuclear one. And again, we find actually um, fully uh, 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 spin uh, polarized graviton with uh, excitation minus two uh, as well. So there is no, um, there is no uh, spectral weight for plus two, but only minus two. Uh, and that, of course, is because the more read state uh, using this dancing pattern picture has the same priority as the locking state. On the other hand, the five half is actually very, very unusual. Uh, and actually, uh, more read is actually not the only uh, possible dancing pattern. Uh, there are other dancing patterns, including anti Fafian, which is a particle hole conjugated version. One half filling is very special because when you perform particle transformation, it's still one half. So the anti fafian should have uh, the almost the same physics, but the chirality is actually opposite. And uh, recently, uh, 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 this uh, uh, so-called particle hole fafian, which I don't have time to get into uh, in today's talk, is uh, uh, is uh, 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 getting some uh, some uh, some popularity, if you wish, uh, due to some uh, experimental evidence uh, supporting it. So, so the last point, I think I have just uh, two minutes, uh, enough time to make that, is we can actually use the graviton chirality uh, to actually uh, at least to distinguish, well, first of all, probe the chirality of the state and possibly uh, distinguish among these, uh, these uh, uh, competing states at five half. So if we just use the cooling interaction, like what we have been doing at half filling, uh, you would get a particle symmetric situation, so there'd be no net priority. And indeed, if you calculate the spectral function, you'll get exactly the same for plus two and minus two. So I don't need to even need to specify which version of this is. However, if you were to introduce a small perturbation that breaks particle symmetry, which is always present due to, let's say, lambda level mixing effects, uh, among other things, uh, it does a lot of complicated things, but one of the things which I think people believe uh, are the most important effect is it, it introduces a three body interaction, which breaks particle symmetry. So if we were to introduce a small three body interaction that is positive, that favors the Fafian uh, against the anti -Fafian. And in that case, we indeed find that the spectral weight is dominated by minus two. So the plus two spectral weight is still there, but it's uh, only some 20% of the spectral weight of the uh, minus two uh, spectral weight. On the other hand, if you add a small negative three body interaction, that favors the anti um, Well, in that case, uh, the reverse happens, which is the plus two spectral weight dominates and the uh, minus two uh, spectral weight is uh, less than 10%. So we are uh, in the process of uh, writing uh, this calculation up and hopefully it will come out uh, soon on the archive. Um, anyway, so that's all the uh, results I have to present. So let me actually uh, end with some uh, closing uh, remarks. So uh, we have heard so much about topology, uh, not only in quantum uh, talks, but essentially in, well, not all, but most of the condensed matter talks these days. Uh, which, well, could be a little bit uh, boring now. But uh, the point is that there is actually uh, still life beyond topology, of course, in quantum, sorry, in the condensed matter physics in general, but including in the birthplace of uh, topological physics, namely uh, quantum particles. And uh, geometry um, plays a, a crucial in ingredient. Um, I presented a few uh, specific uh, results but to coming back to topology, just like I sort of demonstrated in this last slide, uh, the geometrical aspect, uh, these graviton stations exist because of the existence of this geometrical um, degree of freedom, in turn informs us about the topology of the states 
that are actually realized. So it helps us to better understand or actually uh, even detect the topology. So I made a little bit of a fuss about this gravitational wave, uh, which of course was a big deal, is still a big deal in uh, astrophysics because uh, people have pretty much exhausted what they can do with electromagnetic poles. And now they are in the gravitational wave era. Now, in a way, in condensed matter physics, we are sort of in a similar situation, which is that we mostly experimentally focus on electromagnetic responses of the system. And everything that can be done have pretty much be done. But maybe uh, it's uh, time to actually go beyond that as well and uh, try to explore uh, what I would put in quotation mark of gravitational responses uh, as well. And the lastly, uh, quantum Hall effect is such a rich playground for all kinds of uh, fascinating physics. Maybe I will uh, dare, dare I to actually add one more to the list, which is, can we actually use it as a playground to uh, maybe study some uh, toy version of uh, quantum gravity? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kun. So now it's open to questions. Uh, hi, I have a very basic question. Uh -huh. so can you go back to the slide when you calculate the, the, the sorry, the composite fermion? So you just change the potential with the- Yeah, so, so, so that slide that I claim, I, I was trying to explain in every detail, I guess. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. So, so I don't quite get the idea. So this V tilde, you can it describe the composite fermion. So can you- uh, No, no, no. So, so this actually has nothing to do with the composite fermion. This is just a Hamiltonian. So V tilde is a, low, is a lambda level projected version of this two body interaction. So I'm only talking about the Hamiltonian. So maybe the word uh, exactly solvable is a little bit misleading because I'm not solving the Hamiltonian, but I'm establishing an exact relation between the isotropic version of the Hamiltonian and the anisotropic version of the Hamiltonian. I don't know if that addresses your question. So, so all what I'm doing is actually writing down the Hamiltonian and point out that this Hamiltonian contains this exact anisotropy. So, so in the next slide, how do you calculate the alpha CF? Right, so, um, so, so this is of course the, 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 the experimental aspect I skipped. So as I said, um, the uh, momentum space from the surface is actually related to real space by a 90 degree rotation. So the anisotropy of the Fermi surface gives rise to anisotropic cyclotron orbital for the composite fermions. So that anisotropy can be detected by looking for resonances in these graded, graded uh, uh, samples. So when you have a resonance, you actually see some uh, special features in the, in the, in the, in the resistance. So I didn't explain that aspect, but this is a very well developed uh, uh, experimental method originally used to actually detect the existence of composite fermion in the first place, uh, which I tried to illustrate using the picture on the right end. I see, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could I ask a question? Yes, please. Um, I'm a continuum field theorist, so I guess um, my question sort of come at it from that direction. Uh, Thank just you. Yeah, one, comment, one comment I would make, however, is that I, um, I think while actual gravitational waves are you know, definitely a welcome way of looking at the universe, Mm -hmm. Many would disagree that the electromagnetic spectrum has been exhausted as an experiment. Okay, so, 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 so to defend <laughs> myself, I, I heard that comment from people, my, my astrophysics colleagues, it's not my own opinion, but, but thank you for pointing that out. Okay, um, yeah. but, uh, but actually what I really wanted to know was, um, you know, if you look at the, the various uh, quantum Hall effects, the continuum version of these usually takes some sort of churn simons form, abelian or okay. not. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and so the question is, if I wanted to then imagine the gravitational uh, degree of freedom being added, um, I have some vague sense the way you're writing it, how, how, the, how 
matter sees the gravitational uh, distortion. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure what the action of the graviton itself would be. Yes. You that, have that, that, yeah, very good question. So this is actually still uh, ongoing research. So um, yes, uh, so when people talk about effective field theory for a uh, quantum effect, the, the, the immediate uh, 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 thing that comes to mind is, of course, the Chan-Simon theory. Now, the problem with the Chan-Simon theory is that uh, its homotony is zero. Yeah. It does not contain any, uh, any dynamics. So we are here, of course, interested in the dynamical properties of the system. So obviously, you, uh, you need to actually introduce additional degrees of freedom, which actually has a non-zero homotonian. So the additional degree of freedom should be actually at least a couple to this G mu nu. Okay. So basically, pictorially, the additional degree of freedom is this shape. Is this? Uh, I guess I need to go back. Yeah. Is this? Uh, is this? Uh, is this distortion? Mm -hmm. So um, people, uh, including Haldane and Song, and uh, I think a few others, have been working on that, uh, and uh, I would say have maybe some some somewhat limited um, success. And to my surprise, actually, they didn't even have a prediction for the graviton chirality, which actually seems to be very very obvious. Now I didn't uh, spe uh, spell that out. Why is minus two? Let me actually take the opportunity to actually explain why it has to be minus two for the Laughlin state. So for the Laughlin state, you see, when you look at a pair of the dancers, the relative angular momentum has, has to be three or above. And the reason it's a compress, incompressible state is because um, if you want to compress it, then you have to force two dancers into relative angular momentum one, like this situation. Just imagine this is an electron, okay? So the gravity is precisely this excitation. It actually creates a pair, a dancing pair with a relative angular momentum one instead of three or above. So that's the gravity. So the physics of the karate is, is actually extremely simple, but I was extremely surprised that the existing theory uh, didn't actually make that prediction. Uh, but maybe to give you some references, uh, one reference that came to my mind is uh, Gromov and Song. Uh, there is a PRX, I think, published in 20, either 17 or 18. Uh, there may be some follow-up works. Uh, there is a, a follow-up, well, not, not necessarily a follow-up work, a later paper by Sun, which is on the archive since, uh, uh, I think, July of uh, 2019, uh, where he did explicitly spell out of the chirality, but that's after our numerical paper. But th these will be uh, uh, references for, I would uh, characterize as ongoing uh, efforts to uh, come up with a gravitational or graviton gravitation like theory for the um, for, uh, liquids. Got it. And um, because at least in the in the relativistic three D theory, yeah, just looked at the Einstein action. Yeah, that famously Witten put that in actually Chern Simons form. It can be written as a Chern Simons theory, just, just pure gravity by itself. Yes, so, so that, that you're right. That's a purely topological theory, so it still has no dynamics. But of so course, you, say you want to couple it to something like a scalar field or some, some, some uh, other. No, not, not just that. So I'm trying to point out the big difference. So, so we are not doing Einstein Hilbert, Hilbert uh, gravity here. So, so in, uh, in the gravity that you are interested in, including beyond the three plus one dimensions. Uh, by the way, I enjoyed your program many years ago at the Florida State very much. Thank oh, you very thank much. you. Um, so in Einstein gravity, the real physical degree of freedom is curvature. Yeah. But for us, the real degree of freedom is actually G mu nu. So in some sense, we don't have the general covariance. Gotcha. So the relationship between our gravity and your gravity is a little bit like the relation between a vector boson theory and gauge theory. So, so we have different degrees of freedom. Now we are also dealing with the constraints uh, system, which is we have this uh, constraint coming from uh, uh, area preserving diffeomorphism. Yes. But, 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 but we are not dealing with only curvature. So, so, so distorting, distorting G mu U uniformly, which doesn't introduce curvature, changes the physics. It changes measurable quantities. So, so yeah, maybe maybe it's a little bit of a abuse of term when I say this uh, this uh, quantum gravity. Got it. And yeah. in just in terms of even guessing some sort of effective field theory, is it a long range 
force or is it a massless way? How, how would you? It's it, certainly not a massless way. I mean, our, our graviton has, has a gap. Got it. So, okay. Yeah. So, so, so again, there's nothing to protect, protect this gaplessness like a, a general uh, covariance. We don't have anything like that. Gotcha. Thank you. So Kun, I have a question about these excitations. So these excitations basically are uh -huh. um, uh, okay. some uh, ahead, dyna no. dynamics of these, you know, dancing pictures that you were showing. So you don't right. you don't need um, an isotropy at the non-interacting level to no. put excitations. These excitations are producing an isotropy. You know, that's what these excitations are. So my question. Yes. Is charge density excitation, meaning are these like acoustic plasma? More technically, are these poles a reducible response function or irreducible response function? Uh, I'm not so sure uh, what you mean by reducible or irreducible. Um, I think this, well, okay. So, 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 so let me actually say the following and uh, let me tell you if that helps. So we came up with this, uh, this uh, uh, coupling between the, between the uh, electron gas and the, the mass anisotropy. Right, so this is and definitely- And some claims it's, oh. it's the same coupling with, with Raman as well. Yeah. So, so this, this yeah. is what couples to the experimental probe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the simplest you can- Yeah, get. so this is a charge density excitation, right? Because you have the- It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, hold on. You yeah. see, this is a two body operator. This is the product of two density operators. So it's not oh, a simple density operator. This is a, oh. this is, this is a two body operator. The total momentum is actually zero. It's Q and minus Q. Mm -hmm. Now, of course I can make the non-zero momentum, which would actually be relevant if I have this situation by oh, actually changing this Q to minus Q plus delta Q. This so, is a quadrupolar so, mode. It's not a right. density. Right, in the solid state language, then is it, is it more like an exciton? And that's what I'm trying to get to. What, what is it more like? in terms of various elemental excitations we have in- Yeah, so, so, so my answer to Shankar is that people have never thought about this kind of excitation before. Because I you see. can, for example, ask, would, would there be an analog of this, let's say, in a Fermi liquid, your favorite- Fermi Right, that, that's exactly what I'm getting at, right. So, so the reason is it would be very, very overly damp because you know, I mean, okay, so this couples, as I, as I talked about for most of my talk, couples to the Fermi surface change, right? Yeah. So that, of course, is coupled directly to the low energy particle excitations. So you won't see a sharp mode there. It will be some over damped mode. People, talk, uh, people actually studied that. Okay, so yeah, I, I, I don't understand what it is, yeah. So yeah, the, the it, reason it's sharp mode is because of the gap. Right. So the, quantum so, mode, the topological physics protects this kind of modes because it got rid of most of other excitations. Right. It's really the shape oscillation of the Fermi surface, which yeah. is cooler, Fermi liquid, that's like completely relevant because it's totally damped. It never happened. Exactly, exactly. Here, exactly. we don't have electron hole excitations. That's how you see those sharp peaks. They are gapped out, so it shows up here. So, okay, so in ordinary Fermi liquid, these sort of excitations simply don't exist. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Good. So is there any other question? So maybe I can ask a, a naive question. Uh, I still don't really understand this uh, graviton excitation. So should I view this? I know you have this uh, very nice uh, dancing picture, but can I view this as a sound like a elliptical droplet and uh, being doing some motion, like uh, some rotation or it's kind of a changing? Uh, yeah, so, so I gave you one picture, which I think is actually fairly accurate which is, well, uh, in the original Laughlin liquid, uh, you have this uh, constraint that all the uh, uh, pairs have to have relative angular momentum three or above. Now a graviton, roughly speaking, is you force a pair into a relative angular momentum one state. That's why you change the angular momentum by minus two. It goes from three to, to one. On the other hand, uh, well, I think I have some of these references. Uh, uh, these are some of the authors listed. Um, people have been trying to, trying to develop pictures from various uh, uh, perspectives. Let me highlight, uh, okay, you, you can actually consider what would happen if you are near a nomadic instability where the, let's say the Fermi surface or the laughing liquid spontaneously deform. 
So yeah, I mean, there are various pictures. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't converged on the best picture. Microscop microscopically, I, I think the picture that I gave you is probably the most accurate. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there any other question? So if not, uh, let's thank uh, Kun again. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. And uh, uh, let me start recording now. Uh, so okay.